Ruth Jimenez has provided documents tracing her family back to the 11th century. It's like a confirmation, graduation and passing out ceremony rolled into one. It made me nervous watching what's probably the most important day of her life. And you weren't nervous? Oh yes, yes, very <laughs> nervous because I think, well, if I, if I fail or if I, right, no, I, no. I cannot say very loud or yeah, something yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Each generation hands down the knowledge of the past to the next, providing a bridge to Europe's Muslim heritage. In medicina, in astronomy. El, eh, es decir, todo, en agricultura uh -huh. y los mozárabes fueron los que transmitieron a Europa en Toledo, en la escuela de It's traductores cool de Toledo. Uh -huh. claro, exactamente. Bueno, <laughs> well, we cannot uh, forget that the oriental culture was uh, the most uh, advanced okay. in their in their time in agriculture in, in, yes, astronomy in, uh, medicine many different, yes many everything different and the uh, mozarab uh, uh, keep this tradition and give it to europe when toledo the jewel of al andalus fell without bloodshed in 1085 it emboldened the christians Pope Urban II announced a crusade against all of Islam ten years later. Islam responded and sent troops from North Africa to support the Muslims of Spain. Over the next 150 years, the Christians of northern Spain pushed into southern Al-Andalus. They battled with the Muslim troops sent by the Almohads of North Africa. But the troops were overstretched. They lost the support of the Muslims they had come to help, and the leadership started to crumble. By the 13th century, the Muslims were fighting each other, while the Christians advanced ever closer towards my next destination, the province of Granada. Muslim achievement in Al-Andalus had made their territories highly prized, and none more so than Granada, under the rule of Muhammad ben Nasser. But the 13th century marked the great leap forward for Spanish Christendom, and the chief beneficiary was the Christian ruler Ferdinand III of Aragon. The Christian kings of Castile and Aragon could not believe their luck. They were able to exploit the collapse of the Muslim Almohad Empire in Al-Andalus, one after the other, they were able to take Cordoba, Valencia, and Murcia. The Muslims were determined to keep a hold of something. And so Muhammad ben Nasser, who was a small-time lord from the south, was able to strike a surprising deal. In exchange for helping Ferdinand III take Muslim Seville, he got to keep Granada. Dr. Amira Benison, who I'd met in Cordoba, had recently arrived in Granada. Her research covers this period of political intrigue in Al-Andalus. Mohammed bin Nasser agreed to become vassal of Ferdinand III and actually helped him at the siege of Seville in 1248. But again, I think from Mohammed bin Nasser's point of view, it was ultimately indefensible. And it was better to preserve this piece of land here for the Muslims of the peninsula than to try and hold on to things right. which were, were going to ultimately be impossible to defend. And we're standing just across this valley from the Alhambra, which, mm -hmm. given its obvious position, is a sort of defensive building. Yes, yes, I mean, it seems so, but then gradually the more luxurious palatial elements were added. I mean, Granada was moving into the peak of its prosperity. By that time, the Granadans had found a solution to their two key problems high population and relatively unfertile soil. I mean, this is a very beautiful landscape, oh. but it's quite hard to cultivate. Yeah. But they'd gone for labor-intensive crops. They had mulberry trees in the Sierra Nevada producing silk. You had the Vega down here producing dried fruits, which were exported. Uh, in return, the Granadans were able to import wheat and also to use the revenue to construct beautiful palaces like the Alhambra. So it was a clear calculation of self-preservation and self-interest to a certain extent. Well, I think you can see it in those terms, but I think you have to see it much more as 
an attempt by Muslims who are flooding into this part of the peninsula to maintain Islam here. Right. It's the most homogenous of the Muslim kingdoms in the peninsula. Right. We have a population who really think of themselves as Andalusian. The most magnificent remnant of Muslim rule in Europe is the Alhambra. From the outside, it's very much a fortress, dominating the landscape. But I'm told that inside, it's a jewel of Muslim craftsmanship. I'm meeting a friend there. He's a veteran Middle East reporter who fell in love with the Alhambra on the first of many visits. His name is Daniel Gramatico, and he's totally obsessed with the place. The planet is completely reflected from one side and another. It's really a mirror. So water is always in the middle of things. The sky is always blue. Blue. And this arabesque is so thin. Yeah. So delicate. Delicate. And it's human dimension. And these tiles. Tiles. Every motif, like a carpet. Yeah. Had, so had something inside that was colored. Of course, inside. Yeah. Uh, blue, golden, green, red, and yeah. white. white. The five colors in the Arab. We always see the same motif. Yeah. And inside, there's not a lot of light. So when they went inside, they couldn't see the face of the Sultan. His silhouette is? Yes. Yeah. So they couldn't see his face. Very clever. Only his shape. All this de decoration, the columns, the ceilings, mm. the roofs, the couples, is the Alhambra, the only one. Mm. Yes. It's all here. But, but uh, you have lived and worked in the Middle East. This heritage, this living memory in, in the Orient, in the Islamic yeah. world. Is that true in Europe? No, it's different. Everybody in Europe knows what is Rome, know what is Venice, well, know what is Florence, well, know what is Paris. And this heritage from Al Andalus, this world, has disappeared. <laughs> Before he left, Danielle gave me a tip. Look at the Alhambra as an essay on philosophy. Like this staggering array of geometric patterns that shows the way that Muslim craftsmen explored the concept of infinity through mathematical repetition. And it shows the importance of human scale as opposed to monumental grandeur. But I noticed something myself in these carvings. Amidst its beauty, there are little clues in the way that the Alhambra was built that just makes me wonder just how permanent the rulers of Granada and the people who built this fabulous place thought their presence would be here. For example, in terms of the calligraphy and the decorations, the way they used plaster as opposed to marble, speaks to me of a sense of impermanence ab about the place. And when you visit the Alhambra and you see it as a Muslim, you do see it in that way. You feel pride, but you also feel, I don't know, it's hard to describe it. You see it in a, in a wistful way, in a sad way as well. Although they would rule Granada for another 200 years, Muslim control of Al-Andalus was weakening. But Muslim scholarship continued to flourish and flowed into northern Europe, and not just through Spain, but through Sicily as well. Back in 827, at the height of Muslim power in Spain, Islam launched a second invasion of Europe. 10,000 troops left Tunisia to conquer Sicily, an island at the center of east-west trade. This would be a major battleground, not merely for economic supremacy, but for ideas. And that's where I'm going next. to the Muslims' invasion of Al-Andalus, their conquest of Sicily was a much bloodier affair. It took 75 years to conquer Sicily. The capital, Palermo, was besieged for over a year. The victorious Muslims introduced Islamic law, and just like in Spain, Christians and Jews paid taxes for the right to freedom of worship. But after only 200 years, a new invader made a grab for Sicily, the Norman French. <laughs> 